this is a panel that we put together um, for National Public Health Week on obviously the pressing healthcare problem of the day, maybe this century, we don't know, um, on COVID-19. So um, as some of you may have known, I'm Laura Simonoff. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Health. And with me is Graciela Jacek, uh, Heather Murphy, Chris Johnson. They're all professors in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And Sarah Bass is here too, and she's a professor in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, we've actually been getting together as a group once a week and putting together informational videos on the COVID-19 website, which is located um, on the CPH website. Today, we're going to do a panel discussion and it's really going to be focused on flattening the curve. And by that, um, we're gonna tell you what we mean. We're gonna define it. And then we're gonna have a fairly broad ranging discussion about how we can do that as a society, as a community, as individuals, and you know where we are both here in Philadelphia um, and in our country in terms of the epidemic. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is what is flattening the curve? How do we accomplish it? And what's why is it important? And Chris is gonna start us off with that. All right, so the first part of that is what is flattening the curve? And we've heard this a lot, but that's just reducing the number of people who are sick at any one point in time to make sure that people who are sick are gonna be able to get the resources they need in case they need treatment for um, severe symptoms and potentially even need ventilators. So if we slow down the spread of disease, then we're inevitably also going to slow down the number of people or reduce the number of people who need those um, high levels of treatments. Um, what was the next part of your question? Oh, we accomplished this by um, doing social distancing measures. So we shut down universities and non-essential businesses to reduce the number of contacts that we have with one another. And now social distancing, since we've done that, also includes making sure that we're not going to house parties, we're maintaining six feet or more distance between people who aren't in our same household. And that our meetings are being held via Zoom instead of crowding together in an auditorium and making sure that we're taking all potential precautions to make sure that we are not um, spreading disease to one another. So one of the more recent things that we've gotten guidance on from CDC and upper administration has been that we should be wearing masks. And that's something that we're going to talk about a little bit more later on and how that actually works to help flatten the curve as well. So one of the things that I think we wanted to talk about, and I'm going to throw it out to everybody, and I know you all have opinions because we've talked about this before, is that the United States currently is number one in a bad way in the world with infections. Um, we have well surpassed China in the number of reported infections of COVID-19. Our curve is very steep. And so I'm wondering if you could explain to everybody what it is that other countries did that seem to be working. And then later on, we'll talk about what we haven't been doing and what we should have been doing. So just to throw out, I know some of you have been following what other countries have been doing, which might be illuminating for all of us. So Laura, I can go first and talk about, I just shared my screen for everyone who's watching and listening. Um, this is a picture of latest data coming out of Australia. And so Australia is not the only country that's starting to kind of flatten their curve. Um, there's other countries, but what seems to really be working is if you can look here, they started clo closing borders and restricting travel. And so the U.S. did that up to a certain point, but isn't as restrictive as other countries have been. They canceled gatherings like we have done, but they did this all really early when they had hardly any cases. So if you look on this axis, they're like at a 
few hundred cases. Whereas we started doing that when we were a, a lot further along. They've also started expanding testing criteria. And so Australia is not the only country. There's other examples of South Korea, Germany, and people who have ramped up testing. And that seems to be um, flattening the curve because you can identify the cases, um, you can isolate them, you can track them, and you can make sure people are actually quarantining and kind of reducing that spread. And maybe I'll pass it off to another panelist who wants to kind of build on that. Uh, I guess Go ahead, Graciela. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, you mentioned South Korea and Japan, and then those are two, um, I guess, two examples that are a little bit different in the way they went about trying to deal uh, with the corona, uh, COVID-19 epidemic, uh, pandemic at this point. Uh, so one, uh, South Korea, essentially, what uh, they did very early on is active testing and isolation of infected individuals. And they, you know, they managed to slow down the number of cases, but then what they realized at one point is, unless they have um, cooperation from all citizens, that those numbers that, you know, were showing that they were, like, they were slowing down the infection were not as real as they could have been. And at one point they had to go and talk to people at a church that were reporting a few cases of coronavirus. And then what they discovered is that they had provided the wrong information that in fact there were many, many more cases of infected people with COVID-19 in the church. So being very active in uh, testing and isolating is really, really good. But then on the other hand, you need cooperation from the population to provide some information uh, and the other case with Japan is that uh, very early on, they decided to close down the borders to any international travel. And then they managed to keep numbers low. But the problem is that in, with globalization today, it's very, very different and difficult to slow down uh, people coming through the borders. So borders are porous. So that's a good example of uh, why, you know, it's important that you close down the borders. Uh, but then on the other hand, it comes with caveats. It's not completely uh, possible to close completely uh, the borders. Okay. Could we talk a little bit about testing? Um, we definitely had a problem with testing in this country, whereas other countries seem to be testing far more people per capita. And I think sometimes, you know, Americans hear, oh, but we've done all these tests and more than this country without realizing that we have a much bigger population and the number that's important is tests per capita, not, not just raw numbers when we do these comparisons. What's going, what has gone on with testing in the United States? and? Um, how should we be testing? What should we be doing? I mean, I'll take that one. Sure. Um, so in the beginning, we had a lag in testing because um, we had had prepared tests. We didn't take the World Health Organization's test. We decided to create our own. And because of that, we actually ended up creating some that didn't work well. And so we kind of had to recreate them all from scratch. That said, we, even since that point, which has been over a month ago, we can say that we still haven't been good at distributing tests. And even if we look at the number of tests that we've been doing in Pennsylvania, which we ramped up really well in about a two week period. Over the last week though, we're actually seeing a decrease in the total number of tests that have been being conducted. So while, New York City continues to do a really good job of continuing to test people and getting closer to this blanket testing that we would ideally like to see like they did in South Korea and China once they finally went on their shutdown or, or stay at home orders. Um, we're still, we still don't see the, an adequate amount of testing and we're still seeing anecdotally that there are areas that have asked for 2,500 tests and 25,000 tests and they're getting about a hundredth of what they've asked for to actually be able to do testing. That, that, main, that continues to be a major concern and a limiting factor on our ability to 
um, do contact tracing and actually isolate people who are sick from their families and other people that would actually allow us to reduce the um, number of people who are having new infections. So Chris, just for those people who are an epidemiologist, let, let's go back and do like epidemiology 101. Like what do you do in outbreak? Like contact tracing, testing, isolating. I mean, what, what is the ideal standard practice? Right, so the ideal standard practice is first to figure out who's actually sick. And so we can do that by testing. So that's where testing, everything else is kind of predicated on or based on our ability to actually be able to identify cases. So first, identify people who are sick. Next, talk to those people and see who they've come into contact with or where they've been in recent days. So then we can figure out who else might be at risk. And in doing that, ideally what we're doing is isolating people who are sick, quarantining people who may become sick because they've been in contact with that person or been in common locations with that person and making sure that those people aren't then spreading disease. And through that, we would be able to greatly reduce the number of people who, with new infections. But because we can't even get step one handled with testing throughout the United States as a whole, um, then it's really limiting our ability to stop new infections. So just to throw it out to all of you, it, is, is this some of the reason that um, we're having such a problem with this in the United States? Well, I can th talk about it also from a kind of communication standpoint, I think, too, which is that if you look at a lot of these countries who um, have done a better job of flattening the curve um, and, and done things quickly, there's been very strong uh, kind of national communication around what has to be done and kind of putting behind it what needs to be done. Um, and we haven't had that here. So here it's been very piecemeal with all of the different states and the governors and depending on who the governor is or, you know, what they're willing to do within their own state. And then they're kind of being pitted against each other in many ways and trying to get all of these equipment, the, the testing and, and the PPE and all of that, um, that without that kind of federal communication uh, up at the top, we haven't really been able to um, do the kinds of things we need to do from a public health perspective. And, and so um, just, just get, for each of you, I'd, I'd be interested, what do you think we should do now? I mean, here we are, we've got, I don't remember what the latest is, I didn't look this morning, but I know it's what, 350,000 deaths? Let's see what Let's it see. is. The total okay. deaths, so this is across the country. Let's see, here we go. Ah, 360,000. Oh, yeah. 360,000. Uh, and over 11,000 deaths. So, where do you think we need to go right now? I mean, what, what should we all be doing? I mean, one of the things that I've seen in the paper, and I actually noticed over the weekend, the sun came out, it was, everything was lovely, and everybody went out. Mm -hmm. So and what do you think we need to do at this point? Just, is it the fact that nobody should go outside? Nobody should take a walk? What, what should we be doing? Because Americans really are having a difficult time with social distancing. I think I, think I can, sorry, Heather. Uh, I think that at this point, what we need to do is uh, essentially practice social distancing. That's what's working. In the app, I mean, we need uh, to test more people to know who is infected, who's not infected. There are cases. Uh, in fact, that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, pre and these are people who are infected and not showing signs of uh, infection and uh, symptoms of infection. And so these are the people who go outside and these are the people who become the spreaders. They don't know that they are sick. And then whenever they talk or cough or sneeze, they are uh, releasing those droplets and that aerosol uh, with the virus into the air. So uh, this is why uh, we need to practice social distancing, staying at least six feet away from people, if possible. And when we go to places such as the supermarket or pharmacy, then uh, as of uh, 
April 3rd, Friday, the CDC now is recommending that anybody who goes outside carries a cloth, cloth a homemade cloth face mask. And they, if you go to the CDC website, you can see different ways in which you can uh, make a cloth uh, face mask. I just want to stop you right there about masks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we did a video yeah. a few weeks ago and we said, no masks, don't use a mask. Now, yeah. all of a sudden, everybody's being told, and I think this is part of the problem in messaging, mm -hmm. you know, people say masks, no masks, maybe two weeks from now, it'll be no masks again. What is it about this that's, I, I think a lot of this is being confusing for people. I don't think we have our messaging act in order. So I do want to focus on the masks because I think a lot of people are very, very confused about why suddenly we should wear masks. I, I can jump in there, Laura. I think the confusion about masks at, at the beginning, like a mask is probably not, was never going to do anybody any harm. But the fear was that the masks were going to be taken away from healthcare providers that really need them the most, which I think is still the case. You still see people with medical masks and there's no need for the general public to have a medical mask. Um, However, we don't know, as Graciela said, about the transmission rates and that third, up to 25, up to even 50% of people might be transmitting without symptoms. So just having everybody wearing a mask will prevent you from giving it to somebody else if you're mm -hmm. infected and you don't know it. So close contact in pharmacies and grocery stores and even outside in busy cities where you can't get physical distancing, we don't know if someone is like just breathing out and having a conversation and then transmitting the illness. So that's where the, the confusion comes with the, with the mask is that before they're like, well, we don't want to tell everyone to wear a mask and then they hoard them. So our medical professionals don't have them. Um, and then now they're like, well, there might be some benefit with everybody because the social distancing, I think people still want to go outside and are, are not really practicing social distancing the way that they should. Even people, they think they're in the same family, but they reside in two different homes. They're still getting together. Um, and that's not social distancing. Like people are kind of interpreting what they think should be happening. And I don't think that's the case. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's one of the main issues, um, like I talked about from that, you know, communication standpoint of not having really good communication that's coming from the, the federal level, is that we all fall back into this idea of optimism bias, right? This isn't going to happen to me. Um, you know, you might have had that at the beginning, then we had kind of a, an increase in our risk perception around this because all of these things were happening. And then day to day, as we, you know, are are kind of stuck in our houses and and we don't think this is going to happen to us then we kind of fall into our uh, our old patterns and part of that is that the messaging at the beginning was very inconsistent from all of these different levels so you had federal level saying one thing you had your governor saying another thing you maybe had a mayor saying another thing um, and so what we end up doing is is kind of filling in all of the gaps of this um, miscommunication and then that information becomes um, what we decide is important rather than what we're being told is important from from those who uh, have that information and I think that's a real problem I think that's why you do have you know a, a number of people who aren't doing what they're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing so um, is it Heather or Chris that's pulled up this map of Pennsylvania. It's Heather. Yeah. So this is a great map. I, I love this map the New York Times has because a lot of people in rural areas think that this is just a problem for people who live in large cities. And so Heather, maybe walk us through this map because okay. some of it, because I think it shows that the problem is nationwide and it's not just cities. And just the way Sarah said, everybody's like, this isn't going to happen to me. I think this map shows that um, it can happen in a lot of places. Yeah, Laura, so this is a map of Pennsylvania and the way that this is depicted right now, it's reporting cases per 100,000 people. So it's kind of putting all of them, all of our counties on the same playing field. So you can see that although Philadelphia, we have over 200 cases per 100,000 people, 
so do these other counties. So Luzerne County, Monroe County, and Pike County, for example, are also at the same kind of rate of illness as we are. So um, it's not just an urban, an urban problem. It is widespread. And then I can also pull up the US maps and the same thing, we can do it by per capita. And you can see, although there are pockets that are kind of maybe concentrated around more urban centers, you can see it's not, it's not everywhere, like it's not all urban centers. And then it does spread out into different parts of the states. Right. So, um, so what about the university? What, what do you think we should be doing? I mean, a lot of people have concerns, you know, when can we get back to normal? What, what can we do? So do you have any thoughts about that? I think all of us are really reluctant to try and give a uh, time frame on that. The university, though, has been very proactive in making sure that we are letting the science and the maps like this tell us what we should be doing. So right now, we obviously are not look, running to um, go ahead and open and get back to in-person classes just because we still are seeing an uptick in cases. And we do maintain, maintain um, that uh, we still think that based off of these projections and maps like what Heather has been showing um, are showing us that our peaks are likely to come in the first couple of weeks. We are concerned that in the Philly area um, we could still continue to see an increase in cases because just thinking about our proximity to New York City, New Jersey, we're really in this metropolitan corridor where people travel um, a, a pretty good bit. And so there's still the likelihood, especially over the next month or so, that we're going to continue to see an increase in cases. Um, but hopefully with our social distancing measures, we are flattening out that curve and reducing the number of severe cases that occur so that we're not seeing an overwhelmed healthcare, overwhelmed healthcare facilities, like unfortunately New York City is seeing right now. So what about students, younger people. You know, I, I sometimes think that they think that they're not going to get this. That, so, um, that even if they got it, it wouldn't be very serious. What, what would you all say to that? Well, and that's, that's the message they got, right? Which is that, you know, when we first started, it was, well, you might get it, or you, but you're not going to have serious disease, or you're not going to have any symptoms. And so for you, it's not a big deal, but kind of don't take it to grandma. Um, but unfortunately, what they heard was the beginning of that message, right? Which is that, you're not, you're not going to get it, or if you do, you're not going to get very sick from it. And it's very hard to kind of counteract that now. So now we do have evidence that young people are getting it and having serious disease, and they are probably, you know, a main conduit for the virus to other populations. Um, but what, they're, what they heard at the beginning, which is, you know, uh, kind of us trying to uh, say, you know, you should still worry about it, but unfortunately the way it was framed was probably not the right way to frame it. Um, and now, even though we're now saying, yes, you can get it, you can have disease from it, that um, those are the things that we're not, that, you know, there aren't getting inside um, to, to get people to actually act like we want them to um, mm -hmm. in that younger group. So um, I've heard that about a quarter of the people that have it actually show absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. Um, so you could actually have it and actually not know it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where the new recommendations on masks come in because if everyone acts as though they're infected because they very well could be, um, then we would be all actively trying to make sure that we're not conveying that infection to someone else, that we're not infecting someone else, regardless of whether they're in our family or in our grocery store or one of those other essential employees. And by using a mask, we are really being a lot more effective at containing our own 
viral, potential viral particles or given the time of year, maybe even just our allergies, but keeping those particles to ourselves, and that in itself can reduce mm -hmm. that, um, that spread from person to person, especially for asymptomatic cases. And I, I guess I want to add to that, that as your Chris is saying, is that you are containing the virus to yourself. So you are protecting uh, other people from your infection, but also, on the other hand, other people who may be not showing signs of disease but are infected and are spreading the virus, by wearing masks, they are protecting us. So it's very, you know, give and take. It goes both ways. We are protecting others from our infection and others are protecting, uh, protecting us from their infection. And I just want to make that very clear. Yeah, and to build on what Gracie Ellis was saying, there's also been some questions coming in about masks and do we think that um, masks are going to make it so people don't take social distancing quite as seriously? And that, I think that might be possible. And I also think in the US, our kind of social distancing like requirements from the states is actually pretty lenient compared to other countries. Like some countries have shut down completely like all parks um, like we've shut down playgrounds, but for instance, you can still go to the Wissahickon Trail like that in Canada would be actually closed. You can cross into other states still um, and not just for essential services. For example, in Canada, you cannot cross into another province unless you are an essential worker or it's an emergency that you leave the province. So I think there's still measures that we could be doing more in the United States, but they're not gonna be mandated. So it's up to us as a population maybe to make those decisions and kind of getting back to Laura's point of at the university, well, we can encourage this messaging and as faculty and students and colleagues in public health that we could reinforce like, what does this social distancing mean? And yes, you're allowed to go out for a walk, um, for exercise, you can go to the grocery store, but don't do it repeatedly. Don't go to the store five times a day just because you're stir crazy and you want to get out of your house like be considerate to others i mean we talked too about the um kind of the stick component right which is um you know what's it going to cost people if they get caught um mm -hmm. going against social distancing so heather i know you were talking about some of the the fines that they have for people in was it canada yeah it's five thousand dollars in toronto right now if you are caught not practicing social distancing so the, the fines are high and I would say in Spain, where my sister lives, it's 600 euros if you go outside uh, and you need to have a uh, special permission to even go to the store to buy food. And you have to, if the police uh, and the army is around, they show you walking in the streets and you do not have a real reason, you are going to get fined and you are going to be sent back home. So people are literally, in their homes, they cannot get out unless they go uh, buy food and everything is closed and they cannot go anywhere. Okay, so I just wanna end this part and then we're gonna go to the questions. And um, I'm just gonna remind everybody who wants to ask a question. There's this little Q and A um, button at the bottom. So ask your questions through that and not through chat. Um, so um, really, you know, we're week four of lockdown at this point. What does the future hold? I know a lot of people have enormous concerns that they're never gonna get their lives back together. People have lost their jobs either permanently or temporarily. So what does the future hold both more immediately in the next few months, but also um, more in the distant future for this virus? I think that uh, we should be reluctant to give a definite answer with a definite end date because we still, there are still many things that we don't know about coronavirus. Uh, but essentially, the reality is that pandemics will continue as long as people are susceptible to the infection. And so social distancing, quarantine is a good way of you know, preventing the spread or accelerating the spread. Uh, that's the, the best uh, weapon until we reach herd immunity. 
And herd immunity is the percentage of people that are immune to COVID-19. Uh, well, as long as there are susceptible people, then COVID-19 is going to continue spreading. Right. And so we need that herd immunity, but it's not going to be achieved for several months. So what, may, what happens now is that we have all the social distancing going on and we are flattening the curve. We are, uh, we are diminishing in some countries and jurisdictions, we're diminishing the amount of cases uh, of coronavirus. But as soon as we start relaxing those social uh, distancing uh, recommendations, what will happen is that we are at risk for coronavirus to come back. And this is what we saw with the 19, uh, 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, the first wave came in March 1918, and then uh, the second wave came in the fall of 1918. And that wave was much deadlier than the first wave. And then there was a third wave uh, in the winter and the spring of 1919. So, you know, there are many, many uh, different things we can think about. For instance, we can, uh, many things that uh, could happen and would end the pandemic, but a lot of them are unlikely, but I will uh, talk about, for instance, uh, the virus may disappear. And in fact, uh, there are two other coronavirus, MERS, MERS still, you know, there was uh, this, um, this care about it. There are still MERS cases around the world. SARS in 2003, since 2004, it completely disappeared. We don't think coronavirus is going to disappear because not only it's transmitted among humans, but it also originated in animals, which means, uh, you know, we may eliminate it in humans, but not in animals. Uh, we can talk about, uh, is the virus going to change, for instance? Uh, is the virus going to mutate? And in some cases, uh, the virus could mutate and then um, could change. However, there is no, uh, no evidence that the virus is mutating. And the virus may mutate to become less deadly, but also the virus could mutate to become uh, more deadly. But we don't see any evidence of that. Uh, with herd immunity, uh, as I say, the pandemic will continue as long as there are susceptible people to the infection or until we reach that uh, number of people in the community who are no longer susceptible, either because uh, they got infected and now they are immune. This is like with the uh, measles, like, uh, the measles. I got the measles when I was young. I will never get it again. Or because you get vaccinated uh, and then you are immune, like with the measles virus, you get vaccinated against the measles, you don't get it ever again. But so how, how likely is it though that this is going to be like the measles? Uh, and because usually with the coronavirus, you have immunity for maybe up to a year, mm -hmm. and you're susceptible to reinfection. So it seems just to me that our hope really isn't in developing herd immunity by everybody getting the virus. I think that was the United Kingdom's right. approach initially, and currently Sweden's mm -hmm. approach to it, but that ultimately there's either medications that can treat it more effectively or a vaccine. Mm -hmm. what, what do people think about that? I think that really what our strategy is right now is flattening the curve until we get to the point where we can um, widely distribute a vaccine that will allow people to become immune without having to have having to become infected and potentially not survive it. So we could see this continue um, to like these social distancing measures we could see continue at least in some capacity until we're able to develop a, an effective vaccine that can also be effectively distributed to everyone who needs it. And that's my short sweet answer. <laughs> And that will take a year to a year and a half before we get a vaccine, and if the vaccine really works. Yeah. And again, saying, you know, the vaccine may be uh, effective for a certain period of time right. or not, and, or it may be that we need the vaccine every year, or That's maybe it will be like a measles virus, which lasts for, you know, your immunity lasts for your entire life. We don't know that yet. 
-hmm. Heather, did you have something? Yeah, I would agree with both Chris and Graciela. I think we need a vaccine. There has been some people asking questions about the antibody tests, and that kind of fits into this conversation of, well, we don't know if you've been infected, if you can then get reinfected. And antibody tests may play a short-term role in maybe having people go back to work, for example, medical workers and things that could then be, oh, I've had it, so then I can go back to work and their risk might be less, but we're not entirely sure of that yet. But I think that's the idea around the antibody test is now, maybe people who have had the illness and we can confirm it through their antibodies that maybe they could return to work and we can still social distance and protect kind of our more vulnerable populations while still having kind of these periods of time where maybe people go back to work for a little while and come back or just essential services. But time will show like whether that will make sense or not. I don't think we're there yet. So, okay, Sarah, did you have something? No. Okay. So we have a lot of questions that are piling up. So what I'm going to do is work through them. Um, and if I don't read your question, it's because it was probably duplicative of a question that we've already dealt with. So um, I'll start with number one, since the person's been waiting the longest to hear the answer. And I don't know if we know the answer to this. How many students at Temple University have contracted COVID-19? Does anyone know the answer to that? No, no. Okay. No. Um, you you can look um, at the website though, uh, Philly Inquirer and their tracking number of cases by zip code. So you could look at the number of people around Temple University and you might get an estimate there. Right. Um, so somebody said, do you think China is lying about their numbers or has different um, or does it have different surveillance than the U.S.? <laughs> I mean, that's a hard one to, to answer, right? Because we yeah. don't I have control of that. I think there's been some questions about that. Just there's, there's been some questions about, for example, Russia. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think any of us have any way of, of knowing, knowing that. I, I could make just one comment about China. I don't think they would open Wuhan up if they were lying about their numbers. Um, so I, like that's just one thing they've, they're reopening that, that part of the country. And I can't say like if, if they had lots of cases still, I can't imagine them opening it up. Their economy is, is, is floundering like everyone else's and they want to get back to work and business. So I don't think it's really in their interest to lie, but we, we, we can't comment. Right. Sure. So here's something we can help people with. So somebody writes, it's allergy season. How do I know if I should be tested for COVID versus if I have seasonal allergies? Excellent question. So the presentation of COVID seems to be somewhat consistent. And you guys feel free to jump in, especially because if you have personal experience with this. Um, but it seems to be quite different from the onset of allergies. With allergies, we typically just have the sneezing, watery eyes, and things like that. But with COVID, it typically starts with the onset of a fever that persists, and then it moves into congestion and then shortness of breath. And it seems to be, well, there's some variation in the symptoms that does typically seem to be the progression. So that differs, at least for my personal allergy um, experience. Right. So the, the major symptoms of, of the infection are the hallmarks are, are a headache, a headache um, which actually I had last night from my allergies, but the fever mm -hmm. and the dry cough. And then there are some other symptoms that can get added into it. But I think I saw data that said 99% of, of people who are infected have a fever. Mm -hmm. So if and you're it's not a low grade fever, it's a very high, high a relatively yeah. high fever, yeah. And that all the sneezing and things that are associated with, you know, allergies right now is not something that's associated with this viral infection. Right. A lot of people are saying too that there's a, a loss of taste. And, um, smell. As a, and a smell as a primary mm -hmm. kind of first thing. 
Yeah, some of, those, some of those are milder symptoms. Some people might just lose loss of taste and smell and might not have many other symptoms. A couple of physician friends that that's what they were and they had positive test results. Um, but they've, it's also manifesting a lot of odd symptoms like diarrhea, um, chest pain and congestion and like heart, heart symptoms. Some patients mm -hmm. in New York City have been presenting with chest pain. So if you have really severe troubling symptoms, that is also important to talk to your doctor about. But I think like um, Chris said, like allergies, I think there's not much on like kind of sniffly runny nose, like that's not very consistent with the illness. Um, and so looking for those other signs. But I think at this stage, looking at the testing requirements in Philadelphia, you can't get tested unless you're over 50 or a healthcare worker at this point in time. Um, I looked at the public health website before we got on, so I don't think you would qualify for a test right now. Right. And you know, I guess that speaks to the shortage of testing. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the recommendation is if you have a fever, if you're starting uh, to experience symptoms uh, like dry cough and then the headaches, if you have any questions, call your primary care physician if you can. Uh, before you go to the emergency room thinking that you have the coronavirus uh, because it may be a common cold or it can be something that is unrelated to uh, the coronavirus. We got a number of questions about obviously the future. Um, one was a set of questions about masks and whether the government was going to mandate masks, whether there would be a national shutdown and um, also about fines like they've instituted in New York State. Um, does anyone foresee that we're going to have a national shutdown or that it's going to remain um, state by state by state? Well, I think, you know, for right now, we really don't have that federal leadership that's saying those things. Um, so, you know, the the governors have kind of taken it upon themselves to institute that. Um, you know, we've had a lot of downplaying of the of the outbreak, a lot of inconsistent messaging, uh, kind of no taking res of responsibility at the federal level, and so the governors have tried to to step in, and and it's been kind of piecemeal by all the states of how that's done. So, you know, a, a lot of people hold up um, Governor Cuomo in New York as kind of the the leader of, you know, who's actually responding in a way that people can um, understand. And I think that's partially because, you know, if you if you watch his his conferences every day, it's kind of a it's part briefing, but then it's also kind of part sermon and part kind of inspirational talk. Mm -hmm. um, and, he, and he brings it to the personal where he, you know, talks about being um, worried about his mother and things like that. Um, and unfortunately that's not consistent across all of the different states so I think it's going to continue to be kind of piecemeal um, unless something drastic changes at the federal level. Right. I think in this country uh, forcing people or making mandatory to, work, to wear the face mask is not something that is going to work very well. I think in this country what will work better is also appealing to the good nature of people and the fact that people are good and want to you know, want to be good and want to do their part. Uh, but I don't see uh, that it's going to become mandatory to wear a mask or, you know, to stay at home where you cannot even go out into the yard. So I, I think there's an interesting question that speaks to that. So somebody says, ask how we can encourage young people to follow social distancing and says that her roommate is not following at all and she'll have to move back in with her um, soon. And she's worried about getting sick. And what can she do to get her roommate to comply with social distancing? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of it is going to have to come down to kind of peer pressure. Because mm -hmm. it's, you know, if they're not hearing it from spokespeople above them that make sense to them and that's kind of resonating with them. It may be taking her to say, I'm not going to live with you unless you do X, Y, and Z. Um, uh, 
because it's it's going to be that personal stuff that that might be the most important to to try and get some of those people who are not complying with some of these to to actually start to think about it i think educating people also if you run into the roommate it may be that the roommate is ignoring a recommendation because they are simply ignorant about it so you know you are in public health, uh, so you know a lot of the recommendations. You can talk to people and educate people about social distancing, wearing the mask, you know, and essentially all those good things that we are talking about today and have been talking for several weeks now. Right. Another question, this moves us away uh, from the epidemiology, which is that um, there's been a number of aspects of xenophobia exhibited because the virus was first um, found in China. And there's been um, in increasing xenophobia with Asians and a divide between Asian Americans and everybody else. And what do you all think of that and how, how can we counter that? Well, I will say everybody has a pair of lungs and everybody can get infected. So it's not because you come from a certain country or you are from a certain race of ethnicity or religion or whatever. Uh, that's not going to do it. I mean, the virus doesn't recognize who you are. They know you have a pair of lungs. They are going to infect you and the virus is going to spread. So I get... I guess I get very impatient when I hear that because I, I, I feel like, you know what, you are not understanding that this, this is like equal opportunity. It's not just one person versus the other. Instead of becoming uh, divided, we have to come together to fight against this. Everybody is affected the same way, or maybe not so. I mean, there are some communities that be, are being affected more heavily uh, there are, you know, communities, the poor community is uh, being affected more heavily. Uh, so essentially that, that's what I have to say. I mean, unfortunately, xenophobia is kind of tacitly allowed, um, not only just in our culture, but it's certainly been allowed from our leaders who are calling it things like Chinese virus and, you know, Kung Fu virus or whatever they kind of came up with. Um, and that, you know, that becomes problematic because that, that is, you know, a, a message that we get kind of that underlies all of this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the only thing we can do is continue to, to say, like Graciela said, you know, everybody is at risk. It doesn't, you know, didn't come from one person or, um, you know, just because it or, or originated in one place. Right. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. And, as a, a person who's very um, active on social media, particularly Twitter and Facebook, I have to say it is, uh, it can be hard to kind of take a step back and hope that people are saying things because they actually want to understand more. And I think trying to give people the benefit of the doubt and giving them the facts that yes, like it doesn't matter where any any disease originates because they can all infect us all the same way. It's really important just to get that message out there. And you guys, you're here at a public health webinar because you know enough to want to know more. And so take up this advocacy for via Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and let people know what's going on so we can get people to really take social dis distancing seriously. And if somebody calls um, coronavirus, the Chinese virus, tell them, you know, that's implicit racism, that's implicit xenophobia, and uh, you need to, like, you have to own that if you're going to post things like this. So I think, you know, clearly just glancing down all the different questions and messages, there continues to be a lot of anxiety and questions about, um, are we really doing anything with social distancing? Is it really working? And one question asked, you know, we are social distancing, albeit maybe imperfectly, but the numbers of cases continue to rise. How do we know that what we're doing is working? And I guess we can answer this separately. 
how do we keep ourselves otherwise healthy, our mental health, our physical health, while we live this very um, isolated um, and unnatural lifestyle that we're currently living. So let's take the easier part of the question first, which is how do we know that what we're doing is working when we're sitting in our homes as we all are, but we continue to see the numbers rise? Well, I, I think that we have to take comfort in the fact that experts are telling you uh, or are telling us social distancing is what works best. And as we have been discussing, there are a lot of people who are not practicing social distancing and people who are not uh, putting masks on to when they go outside. So unfortunately enough, cases are going to continue happening because people are still getting together People are still not thinking about others and how they may get infected. And, uh, but we have to take comfort in the fact that we are educated people. We are listening to the experts. We think, we, I mean, we know what's best. And as things progress and we know more and more about the coronavirus, then we are going to uh, keep changing the way we go about doing things. But I think for those of you who are practicing social distancing and wearing masks, that's great. Continue doing it and continue educating people about it so we can uh, flatten the curve even more. So I think Heather's put up on the screen um, a map of Washington State, not Washington, D.C., Washington State, which actually, she'll, she'll explain why she's done that. I, I put it up because it's an example of in this country where we have actually flattened the curve and there's good examples that social distancing can work if done effectively. And so like we might not see this flattening for a couple more weeks and it's maybe still too early to tell what's going on in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. But if you look at Washington, you can see where their curve went and then they then have been, it's been declining. So there is evidence that it does work and it can work in this country. So I think people can hold on to that hope and that this will start to go down. Um, and maybe, I don't know if Sarah wanted to add to that. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, like Laura said, it's it's tough to be home. I mean, I think we're all feeling the stress of kind of day to day. You know, I keep saying it's kind of like Groundhog Day where every day seems to be the same. You know, I get up and I sit at my computer, <laughs> eat dinner and I go to bed and I get up and I get in front of my computer. And so, you know, we have to kind of think about this as um, this is short term. This is not going to be the rest of our lives, but how important it is for us to do this in the short term, not only for ourselves and our families, but kind of the larger, um, our larger community and population. Um, and that if we don't do this, it, you know, we are going to experience you know, something certainly that we've never experienced before in the number of people who are dying of something. Um, and that this is a, a kind of short term um, kind of sacrifice that we're having to make. You know, we can do things to try and help ourselves at home to alleviate some of that stress. And part of it is just, you know, getting the sunshine onto your face and, you know, making sure that you are taking breaks and having as much of a routine as you can, um, trying to stay connected to people as much as you can. You know, I know this weekend, my, my daughter, older daughter who lives in Philadelphia, um, you know, they drove and they sat in their car and we sat you know, six feet away to talk with them just so that we could kind of see them in three dimensions rather than um, on a video screen. Um, so, you know, trying to kind of think through creatively how you can stay connected to people and, and have those routines, I think, are, is one of the most important things to alleviate some of that stress. Yeah, and, and I think like adding to that, coming up with new ways to fill up your social calendar, but like electronically, I think there's a lot of free activities out there. I know I've been connecting with like different moms groups and will vent at the end of the day about homeschooling kids and dealing with all of that. And then 
family board games over Zoom. I've heard lots of people doing. So whatever works for you, but just trying to stay connected and not being isolated, I think helps. And trying to just get simple joy out of day-to-day -day things like, I'm supporting my local favorite coffee shop that's now making granola to go and I'll go and pick it up every 10 days and order it. And then it's still like one of my favorite things that I used to get and I can now just get it in my home. So thinking through little things that might give you joy on a day-to-day -day basis, I think can help with coping. I think also getting out of the house for a walk or for exercise is always also good. Uh, I do that with my husband every day. We go out in the neighborhood for an hour or two hours with our masks, uh, just in case. Uh, and it's nice to see people and talk. Uh, people are being very, very friendly. People, we always say hello to now we stop at a distance to talk to each other and laugh about it and vent about it. So you can still maintain certain amount of contact at a distance with your neighbors also. So it's getting warmer out and a number of people have asked whether we think that first of all the virus will die down because of the warm weather and then people have noted that a number of places like India and in Africa haven't had the numbers of cases or the, the ferocity of outbreak that that say we have in the United States. Does anyone think that the warm weather is going to help? I, Go ahead. I, I'm not so sure. I, I'll maybe speak to the second part because I work in developing countries and I've been in contact with my contacts there. And I think it's they're just not testing. So I think the outbreak is much more widespread than what's being shown. And actually, if you look at, I'm going to pull up a global map again of where the cases are progressing, where they're rising the fastest, you can now see it's in India, Niger, Cameroon, Kenya. So some of these other countries are starting to show more cases and they're warmer climates than us. So I don't know if the evidence is there. There's some thought that if it is like the flu that it will maybe die off a bit in the summer and then resurge, I think we're not entirely sure yet, but I don't think just climate is going to kind of ward it off. But likewise, what we're doing is social distancing. We're aiming to see that reduction in cases anyway. That's, that's part of what the social distancing is. So even if we do see a reduction in cases in summer, it still can't necessarily just be attributed to the weather itself. Exactly. Um. So um, I think um, we might wrap up. Um, I'm hoping what we could do is gather up all these questions and um, maybe put some of the answers to them on the website. Well, they're actually, let, let me just do one, a few. One question is whether um, there's, are there, is there any evidence that other than older people, people with underlying uh, health conditions, if there's any evidence that a person's blood type could um, impact the severity of their illness. I think I saw that, which was people with type A blood, some, I think, pretty anecdotal evidence that those people might have more severe um, cases of COVID. Uh, I believe there was a study outside out of China, and I can't remember what their sample size was, um, but it was that type B blood was the reference group. Type A had slightly higher um, incidences of severe complications, and type O had slightly lower. Um, but Again, that was one study. It's interesting. It was more descriptive than it was anything. So that doesn't necessarily tell us that your blood type causes you to ha be less likely to have disease. But there, I mean, that's something that should be explored more. Um, it was interesting to me. I did read through the whole thing and they did have some statistically significant results. But um, considering that we in the U.S. have already seen a difference in case distribution, I wouldn't necessarily say that we can go ahead and generalize that or say that it applies here as well. Okay, 
So what I'd like to do is maybe go to each panelist and if there's a single message you or piece of information you would want to get out to the public, what would that be? I guess we could just start left to right. Graciela. If there is a question. Hmm? If, you are asking if I see a question. No, no. So what if you were going to give one message, one piece of information out to the public that you think is really critical for them to know, what would that be? Oh, you know me. I can go on and I talk know. forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, one message, social distancing. Social distancing, social distancing, social distancing, and use the mask, the uh, homemade cloth mask when you go out in, uh, to the supermarket or the pharmacy. Um, Chris? Um, that we are not victims. We can all do things to protect ourselves and to protect our families. Um, the virus is not smart. The virus is a virus and it's doing what it's supposed to do. So as long as we do what we know we can do, we can protect ourselves and our families. Okay, Sarah? Um, I would go along with what Chris says is that, you know, we're, we can all be empowered and, and take control of, of our own um, response. But I think also as public health professionals and probably all the folks who are on here are, you know, from public health or healthcare, that we have a responsibility to make sure that we're getting these messages across to all the people that are important to us um, and that we sound like a bro broken record kind of constantly to make sure that they understand why this is important. Heather? I'm going to echo what Grace Ella said about um, social distancing and really preach to your friends and family members what it actually means. Like you can't just get together in a small little group. That's, that's still not okay. You have to be within your home, limit your trips outdoors um, for exercise is fine, but don't go to the grocery store all the time. Um, wash your hands. And the last one is, if people don't know if you want to report social gatherings, you can on Philly 311. They have a code specifically for social gatherings for COVID-19. And I reported some parties this weekend that I saw. So that's something if you feel like you want to report something, there is a mechanism for doing so in Philadelphia. I did not know that, Heather, and I just wrote it down. <laughs> um, I want to thank all of you for, for doing this. I want to just say that, um, we had some questions about what Temple is doing and um, the students, the faculty, the staff, many people have been volunteering. Obviously we have our health system um, that's doing great work. The university has given the Leah Kura Center to be a hospital. The Army Corps of Engineers went in there and retrofitted it. So I think we could be really, really proud of what we've all been doing. The College of Public Health actually gathered every bit of gloves and masks, even a ventilator, gathered it all up from all of our different programs and we donated it to the hospital. So I think we are definitely as a, as a, as a community, we are doing our parts. I would urge all of our students to also do their parts by social distancing, which I do understand is harder maybe for younger people than for somebody like me who likes to stay home anyway. Um, but I also wanted to say that there were a number of questions about where we're going as a university. And obviously everybody is monitoring it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we regularly send out a Dean's Reap update to faculty, staff, and students. And I urge you to open those messages up, take a look at them. And then if you have questions, don't feel, feel free to email me, to email your professors, to email people on our panel. Go to um, cph.temple.edu slash coronavirus. Oh my God, I think I actually finally memorized it. <laughs> and you can see um, a lot of the, the videos we've done. We will put up an FAQ with a lot of these questions um, that will be condensed with answers to them. So thanks very much for participating in this. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay with just your immediate um, group that you're isolating with. So thanks very much. <laughs>